Good morning again. As we begin, I'm going to pray for us once more. Father, thank you that we could gather on this day with churches around the globe, as they've done throughout history, celebrating Palm Sunday when your son marched into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Lord, the people, the general populace, waving palm branches, singing Hosanna. It has arrived. It is accomplished. The Son of God, our King, is here. But as we'll consider today, Lord, that moment of triumph, that moment of apparent victory leads directly to the cross. So be with us. Help us to see that. Help us to see our place in this story. In your name, amen. Uh, Matthew 27, if you want to go there. Today is Palm Sunday. And as we've already celebrated and heard this morning, it's the day when we celebrate and recognize Jesus entering into Jerusalem on the week before his death. He comes in on a donkey. Many of us are familiar with the story. But what we've been doing through the season of Lent is really considering all of the implications that took place after he came in on the donkey on that triumphal entry. Many of the events that we've experienced uh, happen after that, save for one of them. And, they've, and it's become much more apparent throughout the last couple of weeks, and especially today, you'll see how the triumphal entry really set up the events of the rest of the week, that every scene we've been looking at really stems from that moment when he comes into Jerusalem, because it made a claim about who Jesus was, that when he came in, he was the rightful promised king of the Jews. And not only was he uh, a new king, but he was a new type of king. And that new type of king really disrupted the establishment. So today what we're going to find out and what we're going to read is Jesus, we've been watching him go throughout this trial. It's a sham trial that happens in the middle of the night. And in the morning, he's presented to the Roman authorities because the Roman authorities are the only ones who could ultimately condemn Jesus to death. The religious leaders may have wanted him to die, but they didn't have the authority on their own power to do it. And so they bring him to the Roman authority. And that's what we're going to pick up today in Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to read verses 1 to 2, and then I'm going to jump to verse 11. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge, that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Barabbas sorry. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Beside, while he was seated, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. 
we've looked at various scenes in the life of Jesus, and each of those scenes we try to identify somewhere in there where there was a theme that would emerge that may be related to our lives. But there's one theme that was consistent throughout all of the characters we've looked at so far, and that was that they should have known better. That everybody that we've looked at so far, every story we've considered, every scene, the people that were in it should have known better. The disciples that were around Jesus should have known better than to chastise Mary for giving this lavish gift in preparation for Jesus' burial. Jesus' closest friends, Peter, James, and John, should have known better when they fell asleep. Judas should have known better when he tried to take matters into his own hands and control the situation to achieve his own desired outcome. The religious leaders should have known better than to send Jesus to death and condemn him because of the claim he made to be the Christ. Peter should have known better when he denied Jesus in the courtyard. Everybody should have known better, and yet somehow they missed it. Well, today we're dealing with somebody who shouldn't have known better. That he had no context to know better. We're talking about Pilate. He's caught off guard by the whole thing. He has no idea what to think, and he's stuck in the middle. And the defining characteristic of Pilate is that he's confused. And yet, just like everyone else that we've seen in our series, Jesus loves people who are confused. So let's take a look at this story and think about what's happening here. See, whatever else you think about Pilate, the this, this central thing that he's trying to discover is what is truth. What's the truth in this situation? He's trying to discover what to believe in the midst of what would have been this extremely complex situation. Extremely complex. More complex than we normally give it credit for. Pilate was not a very high-ranking Roman official. In fact, it's part of what makes this story so shocking is that this story with Pilate happens in a remote outpost of the Roman Empire with like a remote and, a, and a kind of an outlier and a low-level government employee who ultimately sentences Jesus to death. You know, he's a governor, but there were a lot of governors, and he was a lower-level governor at that. So there were governors that governed all of the areas in the Roman Empire, and he was one of those people. He didn't even live in Jerusalem. He would have gone to Jerusalem occasionally during big moments like this, during the Passover. But generally, he probably lived in Caesarea, which is in Israel, but along the Mediterranean coast, because he would have had to travel back to Rome, and it was a lot easier for him to go from a port city like Caesarea back to Rome and back and, and, back and forth between those two cities. So he didn't often spend time in Jerusalem, but he happened to be there during this Passover feast, when it was time to keep the peace when the population of Jerusalem increased significantly and there was need for added Roman presence. That was when Pilate would go back. Well, just like everyone else who's employed by Rome or has been given power by Rome, Pilate's chief responsibility is very simple. Don't let the people rebel. Don't allow an uprising or a revolt within your area that you oversee. Avoid revolution and rebellion at all costs and oversee the collection of taxes to keep the machine rolling. Now, there's an aside here that's worth mentioning, and I mention it every time we come to some reference to this in the Roman machine and, and the taxation. You may recall the phrase Pax Romana, which means Roman peace. And if you study this, historically, you know that there was this period of peace that extended from about 30 B.C., all the way until the end of the second century, and late into the second century, actually, A.D. And the reason that the peace existed wasn't just because everyone decided to get along. It's one of the most significant and lengthy periods of peace in the history of the world, but it wasn't just because everyone was like, let's all be friends for a couple hundred years. I mean, the reason that the peace happened is because Rome had, or through Greece initially, and then Rome would overtook the entire, uh, the entire area, that it all existed, and it existed under Rome, and R Rome ruled it with an iron fist. And everything would be fine so long as you did what Rome wanted. Like, they would allow you to govern yourself. They'd allow you to live how you wanted, to pursue the traditions and everything that you might have celebrated in your local cultures. But you had to do exactly what Rome wanted, including paying taxes. And so nobody would fight with one another. Even other nations wouldn't fight with one another because the chance always existed that if you started a rebellion or just an argument with a neighboring clan, Rome might swoop in and declare you guilty. Just decide one of you is guilty and we're going to kill the whole lot of you. Or both of you are guilty and we'll just get rid of all of you. That they ruled with such an iron fist that they basically demanded allegiance. And if you, were, if you gave your allegiance to Rome, they would allow you to live how you saw fit. 
Now, that type of rule came with a very high cost, and that was the paying of taxes, which is why every time you see tax collectors mentioned, they're mentioned right alongside sinners. Like, it's, it is the worst position that you could have in the first century was to be a tax collector. Tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, these are the three big sin groups that Jesus attracts to himself. And the reason is because tax collectors were seen as working for the machine. They were working for the man. They were uh, the, the face of oppression. Pilate, of course, is one of those faces, not as a tax collector, but as a Roman official. This is one of the reasons why taxation is one of the central tensions uh, during Jesus' ministry. That People, they come to him and say, hey, they're trying to catch him in a lie. They're trying to figure out how they can tag him with insurrection. So they ask him, hey, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus says, yeah, you, you pay taxes to Caesar. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. But the iron fist of Rome also meant that anyone who was put in power by Rome and given actual authority like Pilate or delegated authority, by, delegated authority like the religious leaders we looked at a couple weeks ago, anybody who was delegated responsibility carried a burden to keep the peace on behalf of Rome because if they didn't, they might be the ones who end up on the cross. They might be the ones who are punished according to the rules of Rome. The leader was liable to receive the punishment uh, as, just as the people leading the rebellion. So if the Jewish people rebelled in Jerusalem, Pilate was likely to receive the punishment of death as the rebels would have. So his concern for discovering the truth was significant as a result of his position, but also because of the impact it could have on his personal well-being. He goes, if I get this wrong... If I mess this up, if I mess up this trial of this Jesus guy, I might be the one who gets killed. So the stakes are high. Then consider the events that lead up to this scene. Like I said, we've considered some of them. Jesus has entered into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry. It points towards Jesus' kingship. And I've said several times, the populace, the people, love Jesus. He was really popular among the people. They were the ones waving the palm branches. They're the ones declaring Hosanna. It was the religious leaders who had a problem with it because they saw that in Jesus, their authority was being challenged. So when the people see this prophet, this miracle worker, this, they see the coming of the new king. They see the promises that had been made that a son of David would sit on the throne of Jerusalem. After Jesus clears the money changers out of the temple, he begins to heal blind people and people who've been crippled since birth. So, I mean, he's just... His popularity is exploding among the people, and Pilate sees that. On the other hand, he sees that the religious leaders are upset by it. That that very triumphal entry that made him so popular among the people was really ultimately the thing that made the religious leaders want to kill him. And so Pilate sees this situation. And he realizes that, on the one hand, if he doesn't do what the religious leaders want, they could make his life miserable. But on the other hand, Jesus is really popular among the people. So if he sentences him to death, he might have a riot on his hands. That's worse than just upsetting the religious leaders. And then once he starts interviewing Jesus, he sees what he's accused of. Jesus doesn't respond. And he realizes they got nothing on this guy. I mean, he's giving an assessment of Jesus. This isn't his first rodeo. He's assessed other criminals. And he's looking at Jesus going, these guys got nothing. But he won't speak up for himself. And so I have to decide whether I'm simply going to appease the religious leaders or grant him pardon and appease the people. Either way, he's going to have a mess on his hands. And so on top of it all, Matthew tells us, Pilate's wife comes to him and is like, listen, dude, I, I, I got a feeling about this. Don't get involved in this mess. Now, that's sort of an aside. As a married man, if your wife says, don't get involved with this mess, you should listen. Okay? It's just marital advice. Because the point is, it's one of the central teachings of the text, right? Listen to your wife, or you might end up killing the Messiah. That's, I mean, that's basically like, it's just premarital counseling 101. Okay. So is it any wonder that Luke tells us that when Pilate finds out that Jesus spends most of his time in Galilee, I mean, Luke, Luke's account of this, he goes, you know, Pilate finds out, oh, whoa, 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 wait, you're from Galilee? And he goes, all right, I don't, this is not my jurisdiction. He sends him to Herod, because Herod would have overseen Galilee. 
And Herod goes, not my problem. You arrested him. So he's your, and they keep passing it off because nobody wants to deal with it. So now Pilate, he, he tried to get rid of him. He's trying to listen to his wife. Doesn't work. Pilate's regretting probably having come to Jerusalem. He's like, why did he even come here? He hears the accusations. Jesus remains silent. He tries to find a way out. He tries to figure out how he can get out of making a decision. He remembers the custom to release a prisoner and he presents to them an option. You can either have Jesus, the miracle worker, the one who's given some of you life, who's healed some of you, who you're walking around, who gave you sight, all these things. Or you can have Barabbas, who you know is a killer. Which, and he goes, the choice is obvious. Thank God I've come up with this great solution. And the people choose Barabbas. He thinks to himself, well, maybe if I have Jesus severely whipped and beaten, that's going to satisfy their bloodlust and I won't have to condemn him to death. So Pilate's soldiers, probably at the request of Pilate, put a purple robe on Jesus. They put the crown of thorns on his head. They give him a reed, like a king's scepter, but in mockery. John, in his account, tells us that Pilate presents him to the people, bloodied, broken, dressed as a mock king, declares, behold the man, at which they respond, crucify him. Pilate asks again, should I crucify your king? And the religious leaders respond, we have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. Pilate washes his hands of the matter, demonstrating that he wants no hand, in the crucifixion of this man, he declares him innocent in front, of the in front of the crowd. And the religious leaders respond, his blood be on us and our children. And Pilate sends him away to be crucified. Is it any wonder that Pilate was confused? I mean, when you think about the details of this story, why in the world are they crucifying an innocent man? He probably only barely knows who Jesus is, if he does at all. This might be his first experience with him. So Pilate's wondering, why are the religious leaders trying to kill this guy who's so popular among the people that the religious leaders claim to represent? Why are they accusing him of things which clearly are not true? Why is there such hate towards this man? And if he's so terrible, why is my analysis of him so different than what they're saying? That's the reason that the central discussion of Pilate and Jesus centers around the truth. What is the truth? John tells us more about their conversation in John chapter 18. Pilate says to him, he says, are, are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king? And Jesus is like, did you figure that out on your own or did somebody tell you? And Pilate is like, hey, I'm not a Jew. I'm not trying to kill you. I'm not from your nation. I didn't bring you here. Jesus responds in John 18 verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. So you are a king, Pilate says. John 18, 37. You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And that's when Pilate asks the most profound question, perhaps in the Gospels, the central question that Jesus comes to answer. It's the question that gives Pilate away. What is truth? Jesus loves people who are confused. You can hear in Pilate's question the real issue. He's not asking what's true in this case. He's come to the end of his rope and he's asking, how do I know what's true at all? How do I know what's true at all? What is truth in a general sense? Define truth. Maybe he had trusted in his own instincts to discover the truth. Maybe he trusted in the power of Rome to give him authority over the truth. Maybe he trusted in the religious leaders to declare truth. But now he's confronted with a situation where he wonders, does truth even exist? And then Jesus enters into the fray, and not only does he say that there is truth, but he declares that he is the truth. He makes the claim to be the way, the truth, and the life. That's a pretty bold statement. But it's the kind of statement that summarizes the Christian faith because it presents an either-or. Either Jesus is telling the truth, 
or Jesus is lying. It's one way or the other. There's not a third option. And the cross supports the truth, and that's what Pilate begins to see. If this guy, Jesus, is willing to go to the cross for the claims that he's making, if he can do the things that he claims, then in all likelihood, he probably is who he said he is. It's possible that he's just insane. It's possible that Jesus is short a few marbles, that he's a little crazy, that he needs some help. But even if that's true, it's still a lie. It's not like George Costanza, where it's not a lie if you really believe it. That's what George Costanza says. No, it's still a lie. It's not true. And Jesus wasn't crazy. Pilate knows he's not crazy. Everybody knows it. If he were crazy, you have no need for the sham trial in front of the Sanhedrin. You have no need for them to be shuttled between Pilate and Herod. You have no need for Annas. You have no need for anybody. Nobody loses sleep over a lunatic. Nobody. But the point that Jesus might be crazy doesn't even come up. The only thing that Pilate is out to discover is that he's telling the truth or he's blatantly and openly lying and Pilate knows that nobody lies themselves into a crucifixion. Nobody. And if you think that's a possibility, it's probably because you don't understand what crucifixion was. If you think that Jesus would lie all the way up and through his crucifixion, you don't understand what historians say is the most torturous device ever invented in all of the history of humanity. The crucifixion. The cross of Christ. You don't lie to get yourself crucified. That's why Pilate tries to get out of it. Because he knows Jesus is telling the truth. It's why he it's like tries to listen to his wife. It's why he washes his hands. It's why he sends him to Herod. It's why he calls out Barabbas. He's like, I got to get out of this because this guy is not lying. But I don't know how to solve the problem that I have in front of me. And so when he sends Jesus to the cross, despite the protests of the religious leaders, the sign he puts on the headboard of the cross is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And the religious leaders go, hold up. No, no, no. You have to write, he claimed to be the King of the Jews. And Pilate goes, what I've written, I've written. Because he knows this man is telling the truth. See, that's what Christianity is. It's a claim about what is true. That's the reason it's so divisive at times, because it forces you to either accept it or deny it, but you can't ignore it. This happened. A man named Jesus, who lived in history, was crucified in the first century under the reign of the governor Pilate when Herod ruled over Galilee, while Caiaphas was the high priest in Jerusalem, and his father-in-law, Annas, pulled the strings from behind the scenes. That happened. That's a historical fact. The question is, was Jesus who he said he was? Was Jesus who he said he was? And that's the truth claim that the Christian makes. But if we're going to make that truth claim, it requires something from us, and it's something that Jesus demonstrates for us in his interaction with Pilate. Because you and I, stepping into the world today, are stepping into the same environment that Jesus steps into when he steps into Pilate's headquarters. We're stepping into a world that's confused. We're stepping into a world that doesn't know the truth and doesn't know where to find it, even if it exists. Look for this. Look for the confusion in the media or on the internet, and you'll see it plain as day, especially when challenging things happen or difficult things to explain occur, when there's suffering, when there's tragedy, and all of a sudden, people become unhinged. The, you know, somebody said recently that, uh, I don't remember where this quote is from or who even told it to me, but they said politicians used to speak in sound bites, but now they think in sound bites. You look at politicians, you look at leaders, they don't know what they're talking about, they don't know what foundation they stand on, all they know is how I have to respond to this moment right now. This thing that happens, and it could change from day to day, doesn't matter. It could flip-flop all over the map. Whatever I'm thinking in this moment is what is true. People become totally unhinged, disconnected from their moorings. We aren't sure whether truth exists or where to find it. And that's where Jesus steps in and loves people. In that moment when they're confused and they don't know where to find truth, people who are confused, Jesus steps in and makes a connection to the truth, which is himself. Are the claims that Jesus makes about himself true or not? Every single person makes the same and has to undergo the same analysis that Pilate did. Is this man who he said he was? And so as Christians who believe that he was, 
not just the king of the Jews, but the son of God, it requires us to share this truth with a confused world. As Jesus bears witness to it, so do we. But it's going to take three things. The first thing it's going to take is that truth is going to require boldness. Truth is going to require boldness. I think this is one of the reasons that the New Testament emphasizes the confession of Jesus Christ publicly for new believers. That when you become a believer, you stand up and you make a public profession, a public confession about what you believe about Jesus. You say, Jesus is my Savior and he is my Lord. I have put my confidence and my faith in him. And you do it publicly because it's going to require boldness. And what happens after you make a public declaration, you say something out loud, is that you become bold and it typically follows through with your actions. There's a book that I really enjoyed. It's a book called You Are a Writer by a man named Jeff Goins. I've probably mentioned it before. The premise of the book is that you are a writer. It's tough. I don't know if you guys caught that. Okay. Actually, the, the premise is that the author of the book wanted to become a writer. He believed that he was a writer. He believed, that's what I want to do. That's the call of my life. I want to be a writer. And so what he did, a friend came to him and he said, Jeff, if you're a writer, then you need to start telling people you're a writer. You need to start, live out that truth, declare it, say, I'm a writer. He goes, well, I really haven't written anything. He goes, but you believe you're a writer, right? Yeah, I'm a writer. Okay, then you've got to declare that you're a writer. And so Jeff Goins went around. People would ask him, Jeff, what do you do? He goes, I'm a writer. Somebody else, he'd be on a plane. Somebody's next to him, what do you do? Well, I'm a writer. That wasn't what he was doing for his living. He wasn't going to be like, well, I'm a, you know, mid-tier paper salesman or something. He said, I don't think that's what he did, but it wouldn't be that exciting. He said, I'm a writer. And what happened is that as soon as he began declaring it boldly, he began to write. And eventually he wrote a book. And he wrote a book called You Are a Writer. And he sold it. He didn't say, but see, here's the thing about that declaration that started out. Like, he declared it. He made a bold declaration that actually ended up leading to him living it out in his life because he was bold about it. He said, this is who I am. But his declaration was simple. He didn't say, I'm Jeff Goins' best-selling author. He said, I'm a writer. See, this is the declaration of the Christian. The declaration of the Christian is simply, Jesus is who he said he was. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was crucified on my behalf. That we make this simple claim, but it's profound. Jesus is the Son of God. We need to be bold in our declaration, but we need to make sure we don't overcomplicate it. See, this is part of the problem that we have in America, in America generally, American culture, is that when you say to somebody, I'm a Christian, particularly if you say that I'm an evangelical of any sort, there's a whole lot of baggage that comes with that. And people say, oh, well, okay, well, if you're an American Christian, that means you're an evangelical. And if you're an evangelical Christian, that means you're a Republican. If you're a Republican, it means you believe this, this, and this. And you go, hold on a second. That's a big leap away from Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross on my behalf. We have to focus on that simple statement so that we can be bold about the claim because when we overcomplicate it, we obscure what is really, really important. Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross on my behalf. That leads to a second thing. It requires boldness, but truth also requires humility. Here's the problem with that. Everyone in here is a human. And we humans have this really annoying tendency that we present whatever we believe as so profound and so accurate that anyone who disagrees with us is obviously a moron. Every human being does it. Social media did not start this trend. It exposed it where you see it. Very, you know, people post things on social media and they have to do it. And, you know, it's like everybody feels like if I don't share everything I believe in a single sentence, then it's, you know, it's all going to be over. It's just, it's always happened, though. We've always believed that what we think and what we believe is the most important thing and everyone, anyone who disagrees with us is a moron. It's just that now it's exposed in our face. Like if you lived in the 1800s or the 1700s and you just lived in a little community of people and you never lived anywhere but that and you didn't know what was happening outside of that community, you would think, hey, everybody in the world believes exactly the same thing I do. They have the same background as me. They have the same heritage as me, the same ethnicity as me. We all look at the world the same way. We all do the same things. Everybody would see the world through exactly the same lens as you did. And when a foreigner came in or somebody who was from outside your community came in or somebody had that child, you know that kid, he just had to question everything. 
You get somebody who comes into the community with a different opinion. Back in the day, you just call them a witch and burn them at the stake. We do the same thing now. It's just on Facebook. It's just digital. You disagree with me? Well, that makes you a moron and an idiot. See, so Christians, we're humans. And we're prone to the same issue that every other human has, which is that we want to put out our beliefs and what we think, and we want to put out there with such vigor that it comes across as arrogance, and when you present it that way, people don't even get to the content of what you believe. They ignore you. They don't ignore Jesus. They ignore you because they think that you, your presentation was so rigid or unflinching that no one will ever get to what you actually believe. That's problem number one with trying to be humble, is that we need to work on our presentation. But the second thing is, the second problem is that the content itself is actually offensive. That the content itself is, is actually, there's a rigidity to it because it is true. We claim that it's true. The content of the truth claim is that humanity is so awful and so broken that there was absolutely no possible way they could save themselves. And so the creator, God of the universe, had to come down and die on a cross for us, subjecting himself to the very sin that was in the world so that he could set us Free, and anyone who puts their confidence in him receives his just reward. Now, that's offensive. Because at the heart of it, you, you're telling people, oh, you can't save yourselves. Oh, you're much worse than you think you are. You think you're pretty bad, you're actually worse than you thought you were. But God's love is greater than you thought it was. If you're a Christian, that's the greatest news in the world. And if you're not, it sounds downright ludicrous. So why Paul says in the first century, he goes, listen, to those of you who are saved, this smells like the glory of God. But to those of you who aren't saved, this smells like foolishness. This smells like silliness. Like, this is not, this can't possibly be true. Which in the end is the very reason it requires humility. Because the interaction of Jesus and Pilate is a picture of the way that Christians ought to engage with those around us. That he's silent when he needs to be silent. That he doesn't overspeak. He shares the truth. He waits for Pilate to think about it. The declaration of who he is is simple and bold, and Pilate is forced to consider whether it's true. The claim Jesus was making was divisive. Pilate could see that. There were crowds forming outside. But Pilate also saw the man himself and wondered, how can a man who healed so many a man who rides into the city on a donkey, a man who demands no attention to himself, be lying. You see, the truth claim was the content that required Jesus to be bold, but his humility was the context in which the truth claim could be seen. We must present our truth with humility. But then one final thing it requires. It requires action. Can I sum it up this way? Jesus goes all the way to the cross. He doesn't just talk about it. He doesn't just say, well, here's why I came. Hey, guys, I have a good idea of how we can fix things. He goes all the way. He doesn't stop with the claim about himself. He doesn't stop with his humility in front of Pilate. He carries the claim through to the end. It doesn't do any good to say that we believe who Jesus was, but have it make no meaningful impact on our lives. Like if we say we believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins, but it makes no meaningful impact in our lives, and people are going to look at us and go, you don't even think that's true. Truth is going to require that there's change, that there's action in our lives that happens. We get a glimpse of these conversations that Jesus had with the high priest. We, we get to read about these stories. We get to read about who Jesus was, about the truth claims that he made because the authors of the gospel meticulously researched them, talked to Jesus, talked to witnesses, put it all down for us, and now we have it in front of us. And we take for granted that the reality is that throughout most of human history, people did not have access to the Bible the way that you do. That really, it wasn't until the printing press that it was widely distributed, and prior to that, it was mostly just read to you, if you were lucky, in a public gathering of worship. And after that, it wasn't so widely accessible that every single person had one. It's really been only for the last 100 to 200 years that, mo that almost everybody in the populace has a Bible that they are able to read and understand. Now we have it on our phones in our pocket. I have so many different translations of the Bible, it's ridiculous. 
And we have them in front of us. And we think to ourselves, well, that's good, right? Isn't that great that we all have access to the Scripture? Yes, it is great. The knowledge that we have in front of us is really good, except that we're missing the most important thing that moved Christianity from being a little ragtag group of believers in Jerusalem to overtaking the whole world. The one little thing that they did, it was that they had a simple truth claim and it changed people's lives. That was it. They didn't have the Bible. They weren't handing out the Bible saying, go read the book of John. They weren't handing out the scripture going, hey, it's a good thing I got these four gospels. If you read this, it'll tell you everything you need to know. What they had was a simple truth claim. Jesus is the son of God who died on the cross for my sins. And it changed their life. And people around them saw the changed lives, listened to the truth claim, and it ended up changing their lives too. People who came into contact with Jesus loved others more because they knew how much Jesus loved them. They weren't so stressed all the time because they had direct access to the Creator God. Imagine the difference it would make if Christians didn't suffer from the same level of anxiety as everybody else in the world because we knew the Creator of the universe. They were filled with joy despite their circumstances. People looked at them and go, what are you so happy about? This life is a blip. It's not all there is. They weren't depressed about their brokenness because it had already been taken care of in Christ. The dysfunctional government didn't keep them awake at night because they knew the real king. They paid taxes, conducted their business fairly, used their finances primarily for others rather than for themselves. They fought for justice, stopped oppression, eradicated slavery, helped the sick, fed the poor, and generally lived as if the Son of God really did enter into the world and go to the cross. It was a simple truth claim that changed their lives. To say it another way, They lived like they weren't confused anymore because they came into contact with the truth and his name was Jesus. That is the bold claim of Christianity that Jesus is the truth. The cross will be the evidence and the resurrection seals the deal. Jesus is who he said he was. And that's the gospel. Let's pray. Father, as we think about all that we know about who Jesus was, may we be willing to make a bold claim that he was who he said he was, that he did what he said he would do, and that as a result, we live with you in relationship with you and your presence for all of eternity. Be with us, Lord, in your name.